Hello, everyone. Welcome. I'm Ash. I work at Firestorm Books and Coffee. And I'm here to introduce tonight's event featuring two authors, Jason Strange and Bobby Kahn, who will discuss the inter intersections of their work writing about the land, people, and lifestyles of Appalachia. I'm really excited to hear more of what they have to say, and I know our viewers out there are too. Before we begin, uh, for an event that centers land, people, and culture, I want to take a moment to acknowledge the political context of the land where our bookstore is located. For our context at Firestorm, we operate on occupied Cherokee territory in Southern Appalachia and so-called Asheville, North Carolina. Any conversation about land and people requires us to critically engage with the reality of this colonial legacy. And we are committed to continue featuring authors, writers, and speakers that bring such an analysis to their work. For folks attending an event with us for the first time, Firestorm is a 13-year-old collectively owned radical bookstore and community event space with a focus on queer, feminist, and anarchist thought and culture. We host a wide range of events, workshops, and film screenings, as well as meetings for various grassroots community organizations. After 15 months of closure due to the global pandemic, I'm excited to say tonight uh, that we are reopening our doors and beginning tomorrow, we'll be open for browsing three days a week, um, which will be Friday through Sunday from 11 p.m. to 5 p.m., 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. Um, it's been a while and we are very excited to have reached this point. So if you're local or you want to take a trip to come check us out, uh, we hope to see you soon. <laughs> In the meantime, uh, we continue to sell books online through our website and are shipping all over the country. So if you're interested, our full catalog can be viewed on the website, including today's featured books. Uh, so please do make sure to check us out and I will drop links for all of that in the chat and in the comments on the live stream, as well as links uh, to um, Jason and Bobby's books. Um, so like I said earlier, we've got a real treat of a conversation tonight featuring two authors with roots and histories living, working, surviving, and thriving in Appalachia. Um, just one note for those attending on Zoom, uh, if you have questions during the conversation, please feel free to submit them uh, through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen there. Um, once uh, Jason and Bobby, they're gonna talk uh, for a little bit about each of their work and have some questions for each other and have some discussion. Um, so once they wrap up, we'll have some time to answer questions from the audience. But please feel free to submit your questions as they come up throughout the conversation, um, as our speakers may choose to work those questions organically into the conversation rather than wait to the end. Um, but either way, we'll, we'll have some time to, to answer questions. So please do use that Q&A function uh, to ask what's on your mind. Um, okay, cool. So I will introduce our speakers. Uh, tonight we have Jason Strange, who grew up in Eastern Kentucky and Northern California, places with rich histories of homesteading and not always with modern conveniences such as indoor plumbing. <laughs> he has traveled in four continents and 49 states and held a variety of jobs, working as a migrant laborer in restaurants, as a carpenter, in a car parts factory, and as a production potter. He brings this experience to his work as a scholar and professor of peace and social justice at Berea College. 
Bobby Kahn was born in Moorhead, Kentucky, and raised in a nearby holler where she developed a deep connection with the land and her Appalachian roots. She obtained her bachelor's degree at Berea College, uh, which was the first school in the American South to integrate racially and teach men and women in the same classrooms, um, and also only admits low-income students and doesn't charge tuition. Um, after struggling as a single mother, she worked multiple part-time jobs at multiple part-time jobs at once to support her son and to attend graduate school where she earned a master's degree in English with an emphasis in creative writing. In addition to writing, Bobby loves playing pool, cooking, being in the woods, attempting to grow a garden, and spending time with her incredible children. Jason, Bobby, thank you so much for being here tonight. And I will hand it over to Jason. All right, thank you, Ash. Um, so I'm gonna start out, um, I'll um, take about 15 minutes or so. I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, shelter from the machine and, um, and I'll do a little bit, uh, read an excerpt from it as well. Um, so I guess I would say the shelter from the machine is, for me, it's a couple of main things. Uh, one is that it's, um, it's an attempt, it's my attempt to address a couple of questions. And these are questions that um, I had as I was growing up here in Eastern Kentucky. And then again, you know, we moved to Northern California, um, spent time living on the Yurok reservation there. So that was another place where I saw uh, what I came to call homesteading, which is people producing things that they need through their, through their own labor. So that could include growing a garden, um, sometimes building a house, working on your own cars and trucks, um, that sort of thing. Um, so I, I saw this throughout my childhood, but I realized there was a, a lot that I didn't under, understand about it. Um, so one of the questions is just, why are people still turning to homesteading in the contemporary United States? Um, you know, we often, we live in a country that often portrays itself as it has this advanced economy and, you know, the future is all about um, computers and internet. And I mean, look, here we are on Zoom, right? Um, so why would we still, why would so many people, um, you know, probably millions, at least hundreds of thousands of people, um, why would so many uh, turn to things like gardening and building their own homes, you know, buying, trying to buy property out, out in the country or out in the woods and, and living like that? So that was one question um, that the book tries to address. Um, but there was another question that uh, was just as, as deep and it actually for me, it was one of these fascinating questions that maybe seems sort of simple at first glance, but it leads kind of deep. It, it forces you to reckon with the basic, basic structure of our society. And that second question was, why is it that homesteaders often come in these sort of two different groups, two different flavors, if you will? Um, and the quickest way to capture that is just through the, the words that they sometimes use for each other, hicks and hippies. Uh, when I was drafting the book Shelter from the Machine um, for a long time, my, my working title was Hicks and Hippies. Um, I didn't use that because those terms um, have, can be pejorative um, sometimes. So I actually, uh, in the book, I go with the terms Bohemian homesteaders and country homesteaders for those two groups. But yeah, here in the area around Berea, where my research was based, um, the homesteaders and the back to landers pretty distinctly come in two groups. Um, now, there's definitely people who are hybrids or, or, you know, you can't really put them in one category or the other. But that being said, there's definitely these two groups. And then even in um, a place like Northern California, I saw this, the same thing again. And there, there's, um, there's a strong um, native population as well. So they form kind of a third group. Um, but yeah, the, the book Shelter from the Machine addresses that question, why are there these two groups? especially when you consider that they're often, uh, you know, here in Eastern Kentucky, these are folks that live next door to each other, um, are pursuing a similar kind of activism, if you will, a similar uh, kind of attempt to live in a different way. Um, so why should they, why should they at the same time also be culturally very different? Um, so that's one of those questions. Um, like I said, it leads you to reckon with the basic structure of our society. So 
even though this book, Shelter from the Machine, you know, it starts out um, looking at homesteads and homesteading, there's chapters in it that um, just look at schooling, education. Why do some people end up literate and other people don't? Um, there's a whole chapter that looks at jobs, what kind of jobs are available to people in a place like Eastern Kentucky, um, and particularly, you know, for those folks that don't end up with a good book education. Um, so those are all the sorts of things that, um, that you have to look at to answer that question of why there's these, these two groups. Um, and then one other, one other thing before I read an excerpt, the other thing that this book represents for me is uh, an attempt to write the kind of book that was so meaningful to me growing up. Um, you know, so much of my own uh, book learning, that kind of education comes just from reading on my own. Um, I mean, honestly, even though I've spent so many years in school, I'd say more of it comes from just reading, reading on my own outside of school um, than from the reading that I did in school. And when I got to uh, graduate school and started reading, um, you know, a lot of scholarly works by scholars writing for other scholars, uh, I'll be honest, I was a little horrified. It's sort of a lot of that writing is purposefully dense, purposefully off-putting um, and exclusionary. Um, and so I just, I really didn't want to write like that. So um, Shelter from the Machine, from the beginning, uh, the very first moment I sat down to start working on it, um, I was trying to figure out how do you write one of these books that's scholarly in the sense that it deals with serious ideas and explanations, um, but does it in a way that really cares for the reader. You know, it uh, does it in a way that's lively, that weaves in stories, um, that doesn't leave anybody behind or any of that. Um, so yeah, that's my, my stab at that. Um, so before I take up too much time here, I'm gonna go ahead and um, read a little excerpt. And um, this is from a chapter called You Can't Eat Scenery. And this is a chapter that sort of deals with the country homesteaders in um, the area around Berea and kind of their, their history. Because of course, homesteading um, is something that's been going on here in um, Eastern Kentucky for as long as there's been people here. Um, but definitely for this chapter, for as long as there's been um, sort of colonial setter, settlers, white settlers here. Um, so here we go. Let me see if I can get this in the right spot. Caleb Hayward's kitchen is small, just a narrow path wrapped around two sides of the overcrowded full-size dining table where we sit. The kitchen has a 1950s look with, with linoleum countertops and leave it to beaver appliances. A portable TV with a six inch screen sits on the counter beside a well-used white plastic coffee maker. Without getting up from his chair, Caleb fills a dainty porcelain teacup and slides it to me, along with a shaker of coffee mate creamer and a little cardboard box of domino sugar. Sunlight glowing green from the forest flows in through a pair of windows. The verdant light is surprising. The kitchen feels like it ought to be in black and white. Caleb is in his 70s with a strong country accent and a low gravelly voice. I have to lean forward to catch his words. The buttons of his shirt are strained by one of those perfectly hemispherical bellies that some men grow. As we talk, his hands graze contentedly over it like cows in a pasture. He is kind and humble. I'm just a mountain man, he says, referring to his lack of schooling and life of manual labor. These little kids right today that's four and five years old can tell me more about life than I can tell you myself after going through it. But don't let his humility mislead you. He's a sharp and careful observer. His wife, Ada, alternates between sitting with us and puttering around the house. But it's not her house. She has driven over today from the other side of Bear Lake Valley for a visit. They've been married for 11 years, but have always lived apart and have the easy banter to prove it. It's like dating, Ada says with a laugh. The house is probably 300 square feet about the size of the living room in newer US homes. It's got two rooms and a cedar post porch. The toilet is outside in a classic closet-shaped outhouse. 
The cabin sits in the middle of a clearing in the woods at the top of a hill with just enough room for a vegetable garden. Caleb bought the two acre parcel a few years ago from a hippie woman who built the soil and raised a little dope, as he puts it, in a small greenhouse. He sold the greenhouse since he didn't know how to use it, but kept the soil, which is now full of the tomatoes and squash and okra of mid-July. Caleb is skilled at growing and building. In addition to decades of horticultural experience, he is a well-practiced carpenter. He was able to build this house in a month, framing it out of store-bought two-by-fours and keeping it simple and rectangular. He is a woodworker as well. I have to be careful every time I set my coffee down because the tabletop is mostly taken up by an adult-sized cedar coffin that Caleb just finished crafting, sawing boards on the porch and assembling them inside his tiny house. The cedar is fragrant and eye-catching, a glow with curving lines of pink and red like a sunset. Caleb grew up in Bear Lake Valley before the big transition from a world of small-scale farming and handicrafts to a world of factory wages and consumer goods. He grew up, in other words, in a region full of peasants. For a smart-mouthed teenager, the word peasant is an insult. For historians and scholars, it's not pejorative at all. It refers to a traditional subsistence-oriented farmer, which, until the past century or so, was a category that contained a majority of the world's people. Until about 1940, it still contained almost everyone in Bear Lick Valley. That's the area here where I did the research. Um, I gave it a, a fictional name. In 1830, there were no manufacturing jobs in or near Bear Lick. And a century later, in 1930, there were still no manufacturing jobs. Upon the eve of US involvement in World War II, there were few paved roads, concrete bridges, electric lines, or telephones. The vast social upheaval that separates the age of peasants from the age of industry had yet to churn through the region. This is not to say that people in Bear Lick experienced life as static. Their lives were eventful and complex, as full of turns and twists as yours or mine. But the basic contours and limits of their economic lives were remarkably stable. It is much the same with us. My parents grew up in a system where their household economy was primarily based upon selling their labor in exchange for a wage. I have grown up under that same system and barring some epical event like the development of autonomous robots or nuclear war, my son will grow up in more or less the same system. Once the boom of World War II kicked in, everything in Bear Lick began to change rapidly and homesteading quickly lost its economic centrality. Caleb lived through that massive transition, and it's that transition I have come to interview him about. It's also the central story of this chapter. But before I turn on the recorder and begin pestering him with questions, we let the conversation wander. He tells me about taking his little boat down to the reservoir to go fishing, where he spends less time angling and more watching the beavers play. Ada won't join him because, like many country folks, she never learned to swim. He laments the size of the suburban houses being built along the western end of Bear Lick Valley. Excuse me. Everyone has to outdo their neighbor now, he sighs. Every house has to have 22 bedrooms and eight bathrooms. He asks what I think about the war in Iraq dragging on year after year. He's not impressed with it. I'd rather eat cornbread and drink water before sending them boys over there to die. He even calls out local churches for their role in supporting the invasion. Throughout, he keeps my cup brimming with coffee and lightens the mood by joking with Ada. Ada, he asks, you haven't seen my chewing tobacco, have you? No, I haven't. He winks at me. I believe that woman started chewing my backer. Don't take that, she tells me. That's not true. He coughs roughly into his fist, then takes a moment to catch his breath. Jason, he tells me, voice somber, I'm dying. He's got cancer all through his lungs and throat. That's why his voice is gravelly and hard to hear. The coffin on the table, it turns out, is his own.
So that's the first section from chapter three. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Bobby and I'll let her say a few words about her book. Thank you, Jason. Um, and my internet just acted up a little bit. So forgive me if it uh, gets slow and please do let me know if I'm uh, difficult to understand or anything. So I just read Jason's book fairly recently though I've known him for a long time and was just really thrilled to see the way um, our books intertwine and both explore some of the, the same themes. And um, I really enjoyed the way uh, Jason, you know, like he mentioned, intertwining the interviews and all of that into his work. Similarly, I was trying to explore some of these you know, really big issues and very important social issues and, um, and themes and patterns, um, and also do it through the personal. Um, my book is a memoir, In the Shadow of the Valley. And, you know, on the surface, at least, it's the story of at least part of my life, not the entire thing. Um, and as I was writing, uh, this I started in grad school, um, but as I was writing, I realized that it was really important for me to do this again, as Jason said, with care for my reader. Um, I really wanted to write something either like to find the beauty in my experiences, often which were not very beautiful in and of themselves, certainly not on the surface. Um, and then, you know, to, to render the stories in a beautiful way, like to, to try to find a way to make art out of what was often um, just really unpleasant and painful. But I think I was largely inspired because growing up in Appalachia, you are so surrounded by beauty. It's inescapable and undeniable. And so I feel like I really benefited from growing up in nature and being shown this living, pulsing beauty all of the time. Um, and I think that had a huge influence on the way I thought about the world and the way, like, the way my spiritual um, sense evolved over time. Um, and, and it certainly just gave me a very stubborn hope that no matter how bad things had been or could be, that there was beauty to be found. And I figured, by God, I'm gonna find it. And I wanted to put it on the paper. So that was a big part of my goal in this memoir. Um, see, you know, and, and because it's a personal experience, like there, there's, there's, abuse and there's talks talk about poverty and that sort of thing. In a lot of ways, I grew up in a very sort of stereotypical Eastern Kentucky story, you know, and we don't want to perpetuate stereotypes. And I kind of wrestled with this question as I was working on my book, like some of the images that I could have included on the cover. Actually, I couldn't for legal reasons. It turns out nobody wanted to put some of those on a cover. Um, but, you know, the, the images of my childhood and some of the stories, you know, there, there is the risk of them perhaps like perpetuating and confirming stereotypes, negative ones that people have of Appalachia. But on the other hand, this is my lived experience. And I feel like, you know, for those of us who want to see Appalachia recognized and um, appreciated and protected as it should be as an incredible ecological and cultural resource. Um, you know, it, there, there's so much good to celebrate. And then there are things that um, we need to be able to acknowledge and grapple with. And, you know, families like mine are a big part of Appalachia. And, you know, it's easy to 
like to talk about the stereotypes, it's easy to decry the stereotypes. Um, but in some ways, my family was like living embodiment of some of the stereotypes. So, you know, that, that was another thing that I really wanted to wrestle with in my book is to say, like, it's not just, um, it's not just either the stereotypes are wrong or they're right, but maybe, you know, maybe we're thinking about it in the wrong way. Like Jason talks about Hicks and hippies um, and I grew up with the Hicks. I went on to embrace the hippies, even as a teenager, that became my identity. So, you know, I feel like I've been in both worlds and, um, you know, the intellectual world, as well as the um, not fully illiterate, but probably literal challenged literacy. So, um, you know, I just think it's a complicated region. It's a complex region. And that was something that I really wanted to depict with love because I don't think there are easy answers and I don't think we should be looking for necessarily the right answers all the time, but trying to figure out how to ask the right questions. So I'm going to read a couple of passages that will give you a sense of what my book is about and um, the way that I try to get at some of these big themes. This first selection is from the prologue. Life was different in our holler, I came to learn. And we were definitely living in a holler, not a hollow, like you might read about in the dictionary or see on a fancy map. Miriam Webster's will tell you it's a small valley or basin. The dictionary can also tell you it's a depressed or low part of a surface, an unfilled space. But what it can't tell you is what that means, where the depression becomes visible in the land, what is inhabiting all that unfilled space. Only people who were raised in hollers can do that. A holler is a place where you very likely grew up in spitting distance of a relative, or at least close enough to see their house when the leaves had fallen for the year. It's a place where the sun takes a little longer to show itself in the morning, and falls to sleep behind the hills a little sooner. Someone's always discovering the treasures buried in hollers, lumber, mineral rights, gas rights. And when they're not ravaging the forests, we explored as children, unsupervised and unafraid, or not muddling the clear streams where we splashed and found fossils and learned to pick up crawdads without getting pinched. When they're not ravaging our minds with oxycotton and heroin, and low paying jobs and Mountain Dew and broken schools. It is us doing the ravaging, pulling our guns out or throwing fists, taking a beating in front of the kids or searching desperately through dad's dresser while he's gone, knowing there's something in there that will get us high. But the holler is more than that too. The holler is quintessential Appalachia, the perfect symbol for this complex physical and cultural landscape. Here, the word is everything. It is saturated and dripping with history and sorrow and still beauty, a living paradox of place, wrapping its arms around you in verdant honeysuckle vines that hold you close, that never let go. Before my dad's friend burned our house down, I could have taken you to the holler where I grew up. We could have stood on our old front porch to witness the Appalachian Eden sprawled around us, a patchwork of color and beauty and memory. If we looked to the left toward the mouth of the holler, we would catch a glimpse of the white boards of Granny's house, especially in the winter when the two pawpaw trees shed their exotic leaves in her cow field. Up the road was the head of the holler, but nothing really seemed to exist past the sycamore tree that towered over the corner of our yard. I used to stand on the porch when the rain poured down, all other sounds drowning in a symphony of water that beat the tin roof. In the spring, the frog songs reminded me that the land was waking up and the whippoorwill sang its refrain, 
always, it seemed, a love song. A few months later, the cicadas would buzz and hum, and an ominous feeling hung in the air between them. It was the sound of summer in our holler, and I loved it, though I troubled over how those strange creatures knew to break their slumber and join the rest of us above ground. Most of this land is the Daniel Boone National Forest, but Granny had a hundred acres tucked into it and she had given my parents one of them. We had a small yard in front of the house, big enough to play and ride bikes and even let hogs root around in for a time. A page wire fence ran the length of the, of the yard and a one lane gravel road lay just beyond the fence. A narrow ditch separated Mill Branch Road from a hillside that came out of nowhere, and I explored that landscape without end. Sorry, I've lost my, oh, blocking my page. I came to understand that the blackberry brambles by the side of the road appeared in the same places every year, as did the Indian paintbrush flowers the brightest splash of red I ever found in a forest dominated by the green of living leaves and the brown of the dead. The blackberries were sometimes as tart as they were anything, but it was worth the risk when you bit into a sweet one, its juice exploding onto your tongue while the skin surrendered to your teeth. Those wild berries were so good, you might not notice you'd also eaten a sugar ant that was trying to get its own fill. Every year, I looked for two patches of purple phlox, one on the hillside across from where our wooden picnic table sat, and one in the shady part of our yard behind the old smokehouse. I found the little flowers so perfect in their symmetry, blooming again and again in the same places, born and bound to this land, like me. So that is as I mentioned from the prologue and um, just one of my pieces or an excerpt from this that I really think is um, a good example of the way I like to use poetic language in my writing and really try to capture the, the imagery of Appalachia. And as I've mentioned, um, a lot of my work does talk about you know, uh, personal experiences of abuse and poverty. Um, I've had some readers complain that they found that really difficult to um, persist through. And even one woman said that she had to put my book away and walk away from it for a couple of months. But then she decided if I could live it, she could read it. So, um, you know, for me reading it, like I can, I can see the pain and feel the pain, of course, but I don't see it as a story of, about just pain and sorrow. So, um, but since some people do, I thought what I would do next is to read something um, about my granny, who is very dear to me, and who plays a big role in my, played a big role in my life when she was still with us and uh, figures prominently in my story. And as I came to find out, especially after my memoir came out, um, you know, grandmothers in Appalachia are just so significant and really the matriarchs of so many families. And of course, that, it's like that in a lot of American subcultures. Um, so I think that's a pretty fascinating topic. So this is from later on in the book, perhaps about halfway through. Granny didn't talk about how much she loved us. She never pinched our cheeks or patted us and didn't smile a lot. In the winter, she put on thick gloves to carry in wood from her front porch and she stacked it next to the wood stove close to where Papa's recliner sat, where he watched Kentucky educational television and whatever else they were able to get. Somehow their reception was a little better than ours, but we hardly ever watched television there. Junior and I wandered down to her house all the time, roaming around her yard and creeks as if they were our own. She often put us into a bath. Sometimes in the wash tub, she canned vegetables in and with some dish or with some dish soap in a small kiddie pool in the backyard. We seemed to always look in need of tending. 
Other times she sent me to her bathtub and I would sit in the stillness, soaking it in. She would bring me a thick slice of fresh cabbage, which I loved, and I would eat it in the tepid bath water, the soothing quiet like a blanket that surrounded her home and protected us whenever we were there. I took in the details of her bathroom each time I entered, the water heater on the other side of the shower wall, the oval mirror in front of a window that looked into the backyard, their towels and washcloths on a shelf above the toilet, the clean laundry that never sat for too long, the simple hook lock that slid into an eye to lock the door. Granny didn't play music at her house, maybe gospel every once in a while, but not often enough to recall. Her house was clean and it felt old and solid. The wooden steps that we loved to play on and that she didn't want us to play on were painted maroon. There was a window toward the bottom of the steps which faced toward the mouth of the holler. Granny had a small mirror there and would put oil of Olay on her face while sitting on the steps. She kept her round hairbrush on the windowsill. Everything there was holy. Granny had a flock of chickens at all times. Of course, dad sent me down for eggs when I was little. After I stopped being vegetarian, Granny started giving me eggs by the dozen and I discovered their yolks were a deep orange yellow, rich from the bugs and worms the chickens must have found as they explored Granny's yard and fields. When we were still small, my brother, younger cousin and I watched while Granny killed one of the chickens. She wrung its neck, twisting the head right off, but the chicken's body still hopped around for a while. I stood behind the screen door of the kitchen, horrified and frightened, but awed by my granny's strength. My brother and our little cousin shrieked with laughter and ran around the yard. Granny's face revealed nothing about how she felt. She cleaned and cut up the, the chicken, cooked it with dumplings and fed us all as she so often did. When we spent the night at Granny's house, she made us go to bed early. In the summertime, it was still light out. She and Papa knelt by their beds together. They, never, they hadn't slept in the same room since I was born, as far as I know. And they prayed, heads bowed. Sometimes they both prayed out loud at the same time, words overlapping like waves coming ashore almost together, one looking for the other. Granny often cried like she did at the altar. Sometimes I listened to them quietly, but if Granny was praying by herself, she had me kneel beside her, clasp my hands, and bow at the side of her bed with her. She prayed for us all, and from what I could tell, she prayed for us every day. I wish sometimes that I could have the strength she had, with nothing but her prayers to comfort her. Granny had the only kind of power a woman in that time and place could have the power to transmute pain into comfort, absorbing untold sorrow and giving her family a safe haven. It was alchemy. I didn't know that we went to an evangelical church from a Pentecostal tradition. The Pentecostals I knew would speak in tongues and sometimes dance in the aisle, which made me laugh behind my hand because what are these grown-ups doing? Our church grown-ups mostly said hallelujah a lot. And there was some crying and the anointing with oil, which came with overlapping prayers that came too fast in a rushing, falling apart voice that made me think someone was maybe going to do something wrong. When I became a teenager, I asked Papa questions about the contradictions I found in the Bible. I'd read plenty of it on my own and quite a bit in church. I never got to talk with anything, with anyone about the things that didn't make sense to me but Papa seemed safe enough to ask my questions now and then. I never argued with him, though. I didn't want to find out where his patience ended and his anger began. Papa corrected me as to why Jesus turned water into wine, not because it's okay to drink wine now, but because the water wasn't sanitary back then. And when I asked about Daniel, the most famous vegetarian in the Bible, he told me that story was about living excessively, not the harm of eating meat. I wanted to shake his conservative interpretation, but it was enough to have an adult talk to me like I could understand what they said. No matter how conservative their views may have been, neither he nor Granny talked about going to hell or who should marry and who should not. 
They didn't talk about politicians or race or the sin of dancing. They fed us and worked. Papa hunted squirrel and picked blackberries. Granny cooked and prayed and gave us money that we didn't deserve. And though later I couldn't go to church or believe in a literal interpretation of the Bible, and it would take years to undo some of the harm done in the church, if it could ever be undone. I knew my granny and papa to be the kind of Christians some politicians claim to be, the kind of people any of us could want to be. But there is no faking that kind of humility. You can't pretend to love and give and forgive like my granny did. She didn't go around telling people how much faith she had or how good God was to her. I heard it in her quiet prayers. I tasted it in the food she grew, canned, killed, and cooked. I felt it in the softness of her skin, which grew loose and spotted with age, unprotected and unadorned. It filled her house and spilled into the creeks and wading hillsides. It wrapped itself around me, and I held on to that when there was nothing else. So that was uh, a little passage about my grandparents. Um, and I've written a piece too, actually, about um, purchasing their home. Um, the, I had the family home there for a while and had a really interesting experience trying to uh, rescue it as an old house with lots of memories and uh, and not a lot of maintenance for for the last decade or so so thank you all for listening and um i wanted to turn back to Jason, and I swear I could have asked a million questions just as I was reading those two passages. I wanted to keep pointing out, you know, Jason wrote this thing about that, that theme, and Jason interviewed people who talked about this or who lived these things, and I just really enjoyed that a lot. Um, but we're going to talk a little bit about writing processes and some other aspects of our books, and so um, I wanted to ask Jason to speak about his writing process. And, you know, in particular, I'm curious what it was like for you, um, because this book started out as your dissertation, right? And then you developed it into a different kind of book, um, a very, and I think you did a great job of making it both incredibly informative, but also very accessible. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm curious what that process was like, if you'd like to talk about that. Sure, sure. Um, well, there's this term that writers use, uh, it's called a trunk novel, right? So a trunk novel is like when you're learning your craft and you write, you write a novel, you know, you're all excited and you write it and then, it, you know, because you're still learning, it's not good enough to publish and send out in the world. So it goes in a trunk somewhere. <laughs> so. I kind of think of my dissertation as my trunk novel. Um, I really, when I was writing my dissertation, I went ahead and tried to write it in, you know, in an accessible, lively sort of way and um, didn't really pull it off. Um, and so with it, when it came time to write Shelter, I mean, you know, it's not, it's not uncommon that people will turn a dissertation into a book. Um, but I think usually what happens is you go through and you edit it a little bit and you know, there you are, you're done. Um, but the best advice I got uh, was from a, a friend who's written, written several books and he, um, he read through my dissertation and he's like, okay, great. Now that's your, that's your body of research. That's your research archive. Now just take a blank sheet of paper and start over. <laughs> yeah. And uh, it was fantastic advice because I just, you know, you just got to put the old, the old work away, all the old language, I just had to put that away. And so with Shelter, I was able to just start from scratch. And um, something that I did that was really helpful for me was I just realized I didn't know how to write a book like this. You know, I didn't know how to write a book that was wove together story and ideas in this really lively sort of way. So I just looked at, uh, I took several popular science books that I really enjoyed, like The Sixth Extinction comes to mind. It's a wonderful, wonderful book, but it's one of these popular science books that's like super fun to read, but at the same time, she's dealing with, um, you know, really complicated ideas in, say, evolutionary biology, um, 
but you, you wouldn't even know it based on the reading experience, right? Because it's just, she does such a good job. So um, I just looked carefully at how those authors did it and then used that as kind of a guide, and, um, and reverse engineered them. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was, but you know, um, one of the amazing things about writing, amazing and challenging things about writing, as you know, is you really only learn it by doing it. So um, mm -hmm. yeah. So it was definitely in the process of writing the book that I really figured out how to do it. And of course, part of what that means is that it's, you know, you don't just start the book and then write through and you're done. It's like this huge circuitous process. Um, I remember chapter seven in particular, I rewrote the first half of it probably a half dozen times in really different ways before I figured out how to, um, a way to do it that I was happy with. And actually that one, um, just to go back to something you were saying earlier, it's partly because it deals so directly with Appalachian stereotypes, right? And it's like, mm. um, there is a certain accuracy to some of those stereotypes. You can't just say, oh, that's that's bull crap, you know? Um, so there is a certain accuracy, but the truth is way more complicated and way richer. And um, so partly I was struggling with that, but um, yeah, so it was a hell of a process, but I um, really, really, glad that I was able to, I mean, I was blessed to have the time to go through and, and do that work and, and learn the craft. Yeah. Yeah. And all great writers start out as great readers, right? Yeah. Yeah. Going and reading the people who did it so well is so helpful. Yeah, that's right. I wanted to see if I could find chapter seven real quick because um, I thought, here we go. Yeah. I, I ended up dog earing like so many pages of your book, which I I didn't want to mutilate it, but then it's fine. <laughs> after this and after about 30 of those, I said, well, I should just take pictures of these pages so I can easily find the exact passage. And then after another 15 or 20 of those, I was like, <laughs> I really should have taken notes the whole time instead. Um, that would have been the right thing to do. Yeah. So folks that are listening, like, um, so neither, I had not read Bobby's book before we, for this event was set up and she hadn't read my book. And of course, you know, we just, we wrote them independently. And uh, I mean, we've known each other socially for a long time, but the, the books are really written independently. And they're, in some ways, they're very different books. Um, you know, a memoir versus, a memoir of growing up in Appalachia versus a scholarly treatment of back to the landers. Um, mm -hmm. But um, I mean, I think we're both just kind of blown away at the degree to which they overlap and you hear similar stories um, and sometimes even real like specific details that'll come up. Um, and so for me, that was, um, was just, um, I mean, I really enjoyed reading Bobby's book just because of the beauty of the, of the language um, and the, I think the importance of her story and the grace with which she tells it. Um, but at the same time, I was also... Um, it just, I don't know, kind of gave me a reassurance that the, the things that I was, the stories I was trying to share in Shelter were accurate because mm -hmm. it was an independently written book where I'm seeing so many of the same things. Yeah, yeah. It, it was almost uncanny, the, the way it worked out, really. Um, it was definitely very affirming for me as well. And especially because a lot of my experience um, you know, it, I don't know if I can even say a lot. So I'm writing from having grown up female and, um, you know, and, and sometimes that lent itself to a certain um, set of vulnerabilities in the culture where I grew up, you know, but I felt like reading your book, you have, you portray a certain empathy um, you know, and so I, I had to even think back after I was done reading, I was like, well, he actually doesn't talk about, you know, certain experiences. There's, there's no interviews that talk about, you know, certain abuses or whatnot. Um, but I was like, for some reason, I just felt like it's, it's acknowledged somehow, you know, and maybe it's just because of, I, I recognize so many of the characters as, well, some of them personally, and then also, um, you know, just as uh, like 
patterns and and you know sharing so many of the same things from the culture that I grew up in and I was like oh yeah this is like my uncle and my papa you know they did, did these things and I could go to a number of places right now where these conversations are being held you know so it's really wild yeah so Bobby a question about writing for you um what was the biggest challenge you faced as a writer in writing in the shadow of the valley um well gosh there were several i wonder what the biggest one was um well so this started out as my creative writing thesis in grad school and um my initial project was i wanted to like I, I was mostly focused on poetry in grad school, um, but then I fell in love with short stories. And um, for my creative writing thesis, what I wanted to do was not just a collection of poems and a short story or a couple of short stories, and then maybe a personal essay, but I actually wanted to like create a mixed genre piece. I, so the very first iteration of my book was um, about 20,000, 25,000 words or so. And it was um, prose with poems interspersed to tell some stories. And then I also had a short story embedded in there as well as like kind of an alternative, um, an alternative life for one of my characters. Um, so, you know, when, when I set out to tell the story or to, to write that piece, my goal was to tell this one story. And the story was my dad, when I was about five, sent me down to my granny's house and told me to tell, call her a whore. And so the, the creative thesis began with me being sent on that task. And then it basically ended with me completing the task. And so in between, it's just this like really fluid kind of meandering story that um, goes back and forth, um, certainly defying all linear timelines, right? As Appalachian storytelling so often does. So one of the big challenges that I had when I sat down and turned this into a full length book was figure, I was trying to figure out how to retain the Appalachian storytelling voice while uh, creating a lot more um, continuity and, um, you know, getting the, get, making it much more chronologically ordered. So it would be um, just a lot easier for readers to follow. Um, and then also it was figuring out like, well, what is the point when I, you know, what's the point of my story? When I worked on it as a creative thesis, I went to my mentor over and over and I said, does it sound like I feel sorry for myself? Because, you know, there's been a lot of people that have experienced a lot of hurt in this world. And it doesn't, like my hurt is no more important or no more special than anyone else's. And nobody really wants to hear people just complain and feel sorry for themselves. So I was like, how do I turn this into beauty? You know, um, and that was a great challenge. And I feel like that is where it helped me do a lot of inner work on myself because if I set it down for a year or six months, and then, because this was a long process, when I came back to it, I would come across some of those passages um, where I hadn't, I didn't have enough self-awareness and I wasn't able to step away from my, my pain or resentment at that time that I had written it. But now later, later on, I could see it. And, oh, it just made me cringe. And I just was like, oh, I've got to rewrite this, you know, because the goal is to give my readers a gift. It's not to cry onto the page. <laughs> so, so that was that was challenging and something that I feel like was really important and good for me to have to work through. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Um, 
Can I, let me ask a follow-up question. This is actually um, not necessarily about the writing process. Um, uh, hang on a second, that. Okay, sorry, just looking at my notes here. Um, yeah, let's see if I'm gonna find a page here in your book. All right. So let me just go ahead and say, you know, one of the main arguments in Shelter from the Machine is that we get that a lot of the cultural differences that we see between the Bohemian homesteaders and the country homesteaders, specifically or more largely the sort of red state, blue state kind of split that we have going on in the United States. Um, I argue that a lot of the differences there come down to um, sort of who gets access to a certain kind of powerful literacy, basically. Mm -hmm. what it comes down to. Um, and, uh, you know, you all know we have a society where so many of us go, go to schools that um, they just don't cultivate a love of, of reading and, and writing. Um, and so we, some people end up with that, and then a lot of us don't. And um, so Shelter explores a little bit about why that, why that happens. Um, but um, yeah, so a lot of, a lot of Shelter is about the, the power of literacy and how it changes our lives if we are, and when I say literacy, I don't mean like, you know how to write a check or you can read a newspaper headline. I mean, are you someone that, uh, you know, I mean, look at my study here, someone who um, has an active reading habit, someone who has felt the way you see the world be changed by something you read. And that's an experience that like, if you're an avid reader, you've experienced that a lot and it's a big part of who you are. But, you know, I've got neighbors right here on my street who've never experienced that. Um, that's a completely uh, alien thing to them. Um, so one of the things, one of the many striking parallels be between our books, Bobby, was, you know, you have this thread through yours where, um, you know, obviously that your childhood, there was a lot to struggle with there. And there were, sometimes there were, um, you know, you were looking for things that um, gave you beauty or grounding. And so like the land, so beautiful landscape served as that and your grandma served as that. But another theme that goes throughout uh, your work is that um, reading and writing mm -hmm. serve somewhat. Yeah, so here, this is a passage here um, right toward the very end of, of your book. I'll just read a couple paragraphs here. And I wish I, wish I could read more because of course there's beautiful, there's beautiful, the passage is longer than this and it's, it's beautiful, but um, I wrote from the time I was in middle school, even though my classmates ridiculed my imitation of the Odyssey. As an adult, I wrote and sent my work to professors and literary agents, asking over and over for their approval and affirmation to be let into their world. Perhaps I just wanted someone to listen to all the words I had finally found the courage to bring to the light of day. As I wrote, I understood myself as a character as a person in a grand and vast story that endures far beyond me. I wrote and saw myself in a context beyond my family or place or time. I wrote my story again and again until I came to love the little girl who survived it. I wrote to free her, to vindicate her, to give her justice. Writing was my best rebellion, my silent outcry, my ravaged testament to how much a person can love a world that does not suffer her. Writing my story became my duty too, a duty to the grown and still young children who stumble in the darkness, knowing there is something good, but not believing that goodness is for them. I wrote myself and found myself. I wrote nearly all the words I had swallowed for decades, passion transmuted. Yeah, I really like that passage. Um, but could you say you. a little more about that? Like um, how reading and writing um, were tools for you of transformation and healing? Yeah, you know, I, so there was a passage in your book too that um, I felt like was really important and connected to, to this topic. So I'm glad you brought it up. 
um, well, of course, you have a lot of passages that connect to this, but there was one in particular that I had marked um, because, so I didn't grow up in a home where there were books on a bookshelf other than my own bookshelf. Um, I was like, I was just the, the bookworm of the family, right? And, and it's so interesting to me looking back that um, my family, even my father, who was otherwise not a supportive person, um, he, he supported me staying up late and reading books, you know, so he'd give me like the, the, the sly permission to read with the flashlight on. And, you know, my family bought me books for my birthday and Christmas. Yeah. And so looking back, I was thinking as I was reading yours, I was like, how is it that I came from a family that didn't value books um, individually or as a family, but they supported my love of books so much. And ironically, um, like another, another ironic aspect of it is that I often read books to escape the violence and chaos in my home. Um, you know, I would run off to the woods and read, or I would like force myself to read and shut everything else out that was going on. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I think reading really played into giving me a sense of hope of, you know, that, that life is something more than what I was seeing and experiencing in my immediate surroundings. Um, you know, and so the love of reading and, and then shortly after that writing, you know, I think it's probably partially innate that, um, that I had those desires and passions, but I'm really just incredibly fortunate that my family, for whatever reason, supported it. And it's kind of against all odds, I think. Um, and then, you know, like so many people, I think probably women, um, young girls, especially um, growing up in an abusive home, I, I felt like I really couldn't, I didn't have a voice, you know, and I was very scared to speak up. Um, there was another passage that I thought about reading tonight that actually spoke about that, where I was, um, you know, I just wanted to keep my father placated. And so, you know, I became someone who uh, was non-confrontational and like swallowed my truth a whole lot. Um, but I found that I could write it, you know, and writing it didn't get me the same kind of punishment that speaking would have when I was a kid. Um, and then as I, you know, went to school and had teachers who praised my writing for, you know, my story, my Odyssey ripoff story, um, there were a couple of details the same. It wasn't complete plagiarism. <laughs> um, it was inspired by, um, you know, I got that praise from those teachers um, in grades, well, middle school and then high school. And it really, you know, it was what I needed to survive emotionally was getting like this positive attention and like a, a something that felt like love from them. Um, and so it was, it became, I think, the sort of recursive self-fulfilling prophecy kind of experience where um, the, the one place that I felt safe in my writing was getting me these, at times this positive attention from people who were also safe. And, um, you know, so I developed it further and further. And um, yeah, I, and as I grew older and read some of these, some of the amazing writers out there, I was just like, how, how could we do that with words? It's really fascinating. There's something mystical about it. And I've always loved mystical everything. So I was like, I want in, you know, I want to figure out that magic and, and how you do that. Yeah. This is something I noticed in your writing too, by the way, um, like turns of phrase and allusions. Um, 
certain things that you did that I was like, oh, that's, that's a lovely little gem in this otherwise, you know, it's not just a, not just academic or, and certainly not dry, but not just informative either. Like there's this artistry in your writing that was really pleasant to read. And I think makes it really fulfilling as a reader, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I wish, um, you know, as, I mean, I, you know, I'm a professor, I work in academia, and I wish that in grad school, um, folks were, I mean, we never, no, nobody ever said anything about writing in grad school. Um, you know, I'm like you, Bobby, I just, I was a bookworm growing up, and I was blown away by the magic of, of books. Yeah, I, I went in. <laughs> um, and so that's something when I was writing Shelter, I, that's, um, I drew on all of those experiences outside of school for that artistry and that, that craft. But yeah, in grad school, no, nobody ever said really one, in, in terms of professors, nobody's ever really said one word about writing and certainly not about writing with artistry or you know trying to make the language beautiful as well as persuasive. And, um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I think that's, I'm not sure why that is completely, um, but, it's, but it's, it's too bad, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just fascinating to me. The um, I, I'm in my acknowledgments, I think the first line in my acknowledgments is something like, you know, the first, the only person guaranteed to learn something from a book. Yeah, the one person guaranteed to learn a ton from a book is the one who writes it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. And um, I feel like both these books are, are like that. You know, if Shelter had never been published, if it was just this, you know, two and a half year massive process that I just went through on my own and just privately, it would have been, um, I mean, I'm glad it got published, but it still would have been worth doing mm -hmm. because I learned so much from writing it, not just about the craft of writing, but like, I mean, we were talking about Appalachian stereotypes. Like I've been wrestling with those for years of like, okay, yeah, there, there's some accuracy there, but there's so much more. So how do you talk about something like poverty without um, sugarcoating it, but also without making it sound like there's something wrong with poor people. Um, and in writing Shelter, I had to figure out how to, how to do that. And so that's something I just take with me like every day when I'm trying to understand the news or uh, interacting with my students at college, like that's, those are insights that um, I draw on all the time, yeah. Yeah, um, one of the things that I really enjoyed reading in your book, let's see, I'll pull up the exact line so I don't paraphrase it poorly. Um, on page 206, you're kind of talking about some of these stereotypes and then, or no, I'm sorry, not stereotypes, but you're share, sharing stories that would, I think, make a lot of outsiders say like, oh my gosh you know those are wild characters right i don't know what you're talking about <laughs> or or horrible situations and and what's going on with these yeah these stereotypes these people who are living walking breathing stereotypes and then you say i wish i was telling tall tales i'm not i'm leaving most of it out i wish that hard living was just a bear lake thing or an appalachian thing or a reservation thing it's not Life is hard anyway, and then poverty makes it harder. And not just in Appalachia. It's the same in Milwaukee, in El Paso, in Kansas farm towns, in Baltimore, in the Ozarks, in Baton Rouge, in Spokane. These are stories from Appalachia, but they're not really stories about Appalachia. They're stories about America. And I thought that was just like when I read that, I think I probably said yes out loud. I, I maybe even clapped. It was it was a moment. Um, yeah. Because I remember when I was like, I think I was starting to work on my creative thesis, and I was asking myself like, why are my people so screwed up? You know, why why are we like this? And um, I mean, I great deal of my family well I won't go into all that um it's it's really just 
like if you look at it as a flat surface, right? Um, if you look at the scene as a flat surface, it's pretty ugly and disparate at times, just as I think these stereotypes, they portray people as flat characters who are just one aspect of their being, you know, their drug use, their, um, their responses to trauma, their self-destructive tendencies. They're not whole people. And so, you know, and I think that Appalachia has been viewed as not, not a whole 3D, like living region, but as a flattened landscape, you know, unfortunately, not just metaphorically. Um, and so, you know, when I, when I read that line, it, it reminded me how I had come to this, like I had this eureka moment as I was asking myself, like, what's wrong with my people? Then I realized like, oh, the, the news stories that I read about, you know, abuse and horrors across America, um, you know, different crimes and whatnot. These aren't Appalachians. Like they're not my family members. Like there's there's terrible stuff that goes on all over, and in all socioeconomic socioeconomic um, stratas. But I grew up thinking there's something wrong with my people, you know. And I think it's because poverty. Um, well, as a class of society, we we see the ugliness associated with poverty and, and int intertwine it with or conflate it with moral failings so much, you know, that, um, and we don't see our own classism. I didn't realize I was classist until I wrote this book. And then I thought, that's why I would ask the wrong question. That's why I would ask what's wrong with my people because I'd fallen for this like classist myth, you know? Yeah, yeah, Bobby, you got the you've got a passage in your book that's all it's um, the one that you just read from mine. Um, you say it even shorter, page two ninety eight. When people ask what's wrong with Eastern Kentucky, all I know is it's the same thing that's wrong with all of us. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I really enjoyed seeing that line. Um, one of the things I really enjoyed was shelter is um i mean it's a it's a i mean the subtitle is homesteaders in the age of capitalism and i get to just flat out critique capitalism in the book i get to mm -hmm. uh, i mean this is one i said you know i wanted to write a book that was kind of like the books that i had learned from growing up and as an adult as well um you know in the social sciences there's so many crucial ideas things like Scholars have figured out how capitalism works, how economies work, for example, just to give one example. Um, but so much of that work is buried in language that's just not accessible unless you spend a half dozen years studying it. And then, then you have it, but nobody else does, so big deal. Um, so in Shelter, I really got to talk about capitalism. What is it? What does it do? What's good? What's bad? Um, but yeah, one of my favorite parts is, is links back to this discussion of poverty. Um, you know, there's this idea, um, there's, it's kind of a, a theory that goes by the name culture of poverty, right? Um, culture of poverty would be the idea that when people are poor, especially in this kind of visible, like Eastern Kentucky poverty kind of way, that they're poor, you know, there's something wrong with them. Uh, mm -hmm. Like if they just went out and they got a job and they worked hard, they, they wouldn't be like that. Um, but yeah, in shelter, you know, I get to basically argue it with evidence that if you want to look for a culture of poverty, you know, look at the ultra wealthy, because um, those, those are the people that um, whose exploitation, you know, leads to the kinds of dispossessions that we see in these regions. Yeah. Yeah. And you also quoted that same, um, I, I think I want to say it was an Atlantic article um, oh. of it taking 20 years get out of poverty yeah and I I embarrassingly can't remember if I put that in my book or an essay that I wrote shortly after my book came out you there's a there's an allusion to it yep okay yep, yep. yeah that makes sense because 
I, I thought I had, but I was like, I don't think I'll put the title in there. So I was like, hmm, what did I do? How did I do that? <laughs> you know, I woke up one day and was, you know, musing around in my head as I so often do and realized like it had been 20 years since I like, you know, became an adult. So I was probably about 38, 39. And um, I was like, oh my gosh, I made it. And actually, I think it was like, I, it might've been like 18 years later or something. And I thought, how, how, you know, I'm so grateful that I made it out of like the cycle of poverty, but how like kind of heartbreaking that we can predict that and that someone might need two decades of their life. Like your 20s and 30s when when you're trying to figure out who you are and so many so many people who are not struggling you know can be creating amazing things and producing amazing things um and so i just realized like we're we're losing a lot of um you know beautiful art and yeah, innovation i and I'm used in my book too about like, you know, what would this former schoolmate of mine be doing if he wasn't trapped in um, a region where, you know, his his kind of default path was to end up in the county jail, yeah. you know. And I'm not saying like, I mean, we all have to have personal responsibility, of course, but there are just so many decks stacked against so many people um, and you, there's so many places where the, the options feel so limited and, and even invisible. Um, but yeah, like I remember loving that kid as a, as a child, just his sweet, sweet nature. And when I saw his mugshot, I was just like, he couldn't just be some guy that's supposed to be sitting in jail. Like, he was kind to me. He was my friend. Mm -hmm. We we shared an affinity, um, and so you know, I just think he he could be a poet or an engineer or an architect, you know. And how many people are out there that would be those things if they weren't climbing uphill? Yeah, we have this really deep seated myth in the United States that. Um, I mean, it's, I know it's colored my perception. I've had to like work to emancipate myself from it. But this idea that when we, when we see people in their different social positions, right, that mm -hmm. is a reflection of something innate about them, you know? So if you see someone who it was an accomplished professor, well, gosh, they must, they must be smart. If you see someone who's a janitor, uh, well, you know, maybe they work hard, but you know, they weren't, they're not, they don't have the kind of brain to be a professor. That's bullshit. Let me just say it plainly. That is not true. That is not how it works. Um, I mean, we've just we've all got human minds that are just as as rich and capable, you know. And so all of that difference in accomplishment and in stature and stuff, it's just produced through you know social processes, through things like class exploitation. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm just I know like um just going through our society with that myth pulled from my eyes it's kind of heartbreaking to to see that you know um yeah i mean if i could sit down with billionaires i would just um uh, one thing i'd want to say a lot of things to them but one thing i would want to say is like don't you know that it hurts everybody it just dims our society as a whole when you take as much as you've taken um you know, you might think that you float above it in your fly private jet, that it doesn't drag you down too, but it does, um, you know, because of the things that you were just talking about. It's not really like your young friend. Yeah, and that's kind of, I think, part of the spiritual legacy that we're all living out these days, right? Like, we're surrounded by pain, and there's a lot of um, generational pain and trauma 
from, you know, even as Ash mentioned, like the, the people who lived here first, uh, or certainly before yeah. colonizers. And I think in some ways, I, I just personally believe we're always going to be paying that debt in one way or the other, even if it's invisible to us. Yeah, very good. There, and there's Ash. Okay. Ash, you jump it in. Yes, I've reappeared. Well, thank you both for that really um, authentic and personal and sometimes even vulnerable uh, conversation and sharing about your work. Um, I did, there was one comment and if anybody um, who's here, we've had sort of like an intimate sized group. So if anybody does have questions still, feel free to submit those. There was one kind of comment here that was related to a question that came up for me um, while y'all were talking. Um, so this is from Anna who says, thanks to Bobby and Jason, but um, that is totally the myth that hillbilly elegy perpetuates. Um, so uh, I imagine this is typical for folks who are writing about life experiences from Appalachia to get uh, questions about J.D. Vance. Um, so I'm curious um, about the ways I, in which y'all have uh, interacted with J.D. Vance's work um, and some of the things, uh, I don't know, if you, if you have any thoughts um, and maybe some of the ways in which your writing or work uh, is distinguished from the narrative that J.D. Vance sort of puts out in the world. Uh, let me answer that first, because my answer is short. And I think okay. Bobby's <laughs> answer is not. When, um, when I was working on Shelter, I had a wonderful editor, James Englehart, um, who does Appalachian Studies stuff. And I was like, you know, when you're writing a, a book, particularly like nonfiction with some research, you, you, there's always that anxiety of like, I need to read more. I didn't read this, I didn't read that. So I asked my editor, James, I was like, so I haven't read this uh, J.D. Vance guy. Do I need to read that? <laughs> he said, don't bother. <laughs> so I've never read. Billy Elegy, and I don't really plan on it. So there we go. That's my answer. So I, um, sorry, I'm trying to get a little light in here and doing a terrible job. Um, I first submitted my book for publication right when Hillbilly Elegy came out, and um, we had, we only sent out a couple chapters and. A lot of editors came back or publishers came back and said, oh, uh, we're not sure it's different enough from Hillbilly Elegy just based on your three chapters. So, you know, or Hillbilly Elegy, it might be, it might be too similar. Um, we don't know, et cetera. And, and I didn't read it until after I finished my book. And then I revamped my book even without reading it because I thought, well, I need to make sure it's evident to anybody picking it up, like how, how my story is centered around a specific perspective, which J.D. Vance can't have, um, you know, for various reasons. Um, and then I read it uh, several months ago and I just took like fervent notes after a few pages because I was like, oh, well now this contradicts what he said back here. And how did he, well, how did this, and I was going back and forth and like, I really wanted to critique it um, because it is an easy book to critique from an intellectual perspective, um, you know? And, and I think that it's really important not to just try to put him down or put down his book. I don't think that um, just being kind of blindly critical or or hateful about it is, is really helpful. But I think it's noteworthy that, you know, he didn't, he didn't grow up in Appalachia. Um, if you really read the story closely, and I've got notes if anybody wants to see them, uh, you know, you can count the number of times that he references having been in the region. And that all ended by the time he was like 11 or 12. And those were, you know, finite weeks or week, not even weeks, weekends generally that he refers to. Um, and I just don't think that a lot of like 
cultural, like mature cultural analysis is going to come from somebody who doesn't live in a region um, and doesn't even visit after the age of 12. You know, I do think he has some interesting ideas and I was shocked to see that I agreed with some of his um, political statements, not a whole lot, but some, you know, um, and, and I just don't think that it would have become the hit that it was if it didn't end with that whole bootstrap, you know, his, his last chapter or two where he says, we've made this mess and we're the ones that have to get ourselves out of it. And I just think that's soundly um, incorrect to say that us hillbillies made this mess, um, you know, cause I'm not a coal miner or coal mine owner and I'm not a Purdue Pharma CEO and I'm not a lot of, or any of the people who've extracted the wealth from Appalachia. So it seems to me like he looks at, at everything from a very, I blame the victim kind of stance. Um, and it's one thing to call for personal and collective responsibility. Um, but it's another thing to ignore, uh, you know, history. And actually, I wrote a piece about this because um, the Purdue Pharma settlement was announced um, a few months ago, or that I found out about it a few months ago. And I thought these claims about bootstrapping just don't hold up well when the pharmaceutical executives admit to the amount of wrongdoing that they have finally admitted to, you know, and the, the crises that they've manufactured. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. So, yeah. Um, if he wasn't a white guy going on about, like, you know, people need to pull themselves up by their bootstraps in this particular election cycle when his book came out, I think it would have fallen flat and nobody would still be talking about it. But you know, he, he did, he's put his voice out there and certainly got a lot more of us talking about these things and, uh, you know, more people consciously making a contribution to the conversation. So there is that. Cool, yeah, that was, that was very well said and I'm very happy that there are uh, other voices you know, uh, yeah. that are out there. Um, one that comes to mind is Elizabeth Catt wrote a book, uh, What You're Getting Wrong About Appalachia. Mm -hmm. That's a real good one that I recommend to folks. And now I will be recommending Bobby, your book, as well as Shelter from the Regime as, as a more authentic and um, just deep dive into the experiences and histories of hearing from people who lived it. Yeah, I think the, the part about actually living it is pretty important, right? <laughs> well, cool, I think that, that about wraps us up. Jason, did you have anything you wanted to add there at the end? Um, no, I'm good. I really, really enjoyed um, talking with Bobby. And um, oh, Ash, I should also just say, um, you know, I've never had a chance to, to visit Firestorm Books in Asheville, but if I'm ever down that way, I'm definitely gonna gonna check it out. Um, the very end of Shelter, the epilogue is kind of a shout out to anarchism, homesteading as as a form of anarchism. And so, I mean, I was just uh, tickled to death when I uh, started corresponding with you all and found out that Shelter was there in the bookstore and um, I was just honored. So yeah, thanks so much for hosting this. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, great. It was a total honor to host you both. And I, I loved hearing to, uh, your conversation. I'd love to hear more maybe about Berea College and how this all oh, factors yeah. into the region. So maybe we'll have to save it for a conversation down the road. Um, but yeah, thank you again for being here tonight. Um, I just dropped links to both your books there in the comments as well. Uh, so folks should definitely check those out if they if you've not gotten a chance to yet. Um, and yeah, I'll just thank you again and hope everyone has a good evening. All right. Thank so you. much. All right. Good night, y'all. Bye. Bye now. <laughs>